Thank you for joining me today for a walk in the garden. I'm Liz Davey and you're watching this on Norfolk Community Cable NCTV. This show is filmed in my Norfolk garden uh, in periodic episodes. We film about every two to three weeks and we see the garden as it develops throughout the season. Today it's a hot day in July and I'm out in the herb garden where we usually start and there are a lot of herbs that can be picked right now. The lavender has started flowering. Uh, we have tarragon, uh, oregano, uh, some of the herbs that are used for more uh, room scent or moth preventatives, southern wood and rue. A lot of different thymes. I have uh, several different varieties of thyme, English thyme, lemon thyme, uh, lime balm, and lime thyme. Uh, all of these have kind of a particular flavor. They're fun to use in cooking. The mints are also ready. Uh, I have orange mint and chocolate mint as well as peppermint and spearmint. Uh, rosemary and of course chives and lemon balm and lime balm. Right now in the herb garden, if you've kept up with the weeding, there's not a whole lot to do but water. We've been very dry this season, so the watering can is a constant companion, especially for the annual herbs. The perennial ones do fairly well without too much water, but things like the uh, scented geraniums that I put in about a month ago, and the rosemary likes a little water too, and also the perilla, which is uh, an herb that's used often in oriental cooking, but uh, it's kind of wilty unless you give it a nice drink periodically. Other than that, what we need to do is cut things back, and this is the sorrel that we used earlier, and it's still hanging in there, but again, it keeps trying to bloom, so I'll cut back any blooms off of that and put them into the compost. I have some cilantro that I transplanted here. It's going to seed, but I will let it go to seed because I'd like to have a little patch of cilantro here. And this is one of the herbs that will self-seed and then come up next spring. Actually, even better. The same is true of the nasturtiums. Uh, by planting them here and letting them go to seed, hopefully they will come back up next spring and I won't have to plant more of them. Again, I have another uh, scented geranium over here. This one gets a little more shade, but it still could use a drink. And I spend a lot of time watering, less time weeding. I've been pretty good about keeping the weeds, keeping up on the weeds. Each weed, if you let it go to seed, uh, produces about 10,000 weeds uh, on an average, I read someplace. So that's enough to make me get out here and do a little weeding. I prefer to come out into the garden earlier in the morning. Uh, it's cooler then, and it's just very pleasant in the garden early. So I try to get out here, go through the gardens, usually every day, sometimes every other day, and pick a few weeds and just generally deadhead a few things, and then I'm done. The other plant that I will let go to seed is the chamomile. Again, I bought one little plant. It put up a bloom stalk. Now it is seeding. So I want those seeds to grow. So I'll just let them fall here around this plant and hopefully next year more of it will come up and ultimately I'll have a nice little bunch of it. Again, I don't want any more sorrel. That's why I prefer not to let that one go to seed. The same is true of many of the mints. I will try to keep them from going to seed, although mint tends to spread more by roots than by seed. It does do some spreading by seed. So once it goes to flowering, I will take off those pieces. It also will prolong the life of the leaves on the plant. 
Now let's move over to see what's going on in the perennial garden. Color sometimes wanes in the perennial garden when summer comes and the heat. And it's especially true if you can't get out in water, which we in Norfolk are under a water ban unless you have your own well and are willing to pump the water to it. I water what I can, but you have to be somewhat selective in what you water. So many of my perennials will survive with some shade or without too much water, especially if they get a little shade. This end is getting a little more shade than I'd like, but the plants seem to be doing a little better than some of the sun, sunnier areas. Now the colors in the spring that I have are pale. They're t they tend to be more pastels. Brighter colors are now starting to bloom. This is a helio heliopsis, which is the yellow daisies, and daylilies are now blooming. And these just bloom one for a day, for a day, but each bloom, and these are spent blooms, which if you're compulsive, you can take them all off and get rid of them. I generally do not. I will wait until each scape has finished blooming completely, and then I'll just cut the whole stem down. I don't like to see them going to seed on the plant, so I try to keep it a little neat, but I don't take every blossom off, although it does look nice if you do. It gets rid of the uh, ones that tend to be a little played out. It has a lot of blossoms, and it'll keep blossoming for a while. There are some daylilies that will re-bloom. This one is Little Gray Pet, it's called. It's a purple color. I tend to prefer the pinks and purples, though I do have some yellows. And uh, it is not a re-bloomer, dependably. So once it's finished its bloom cycle, which will take a couple weeks, it will be finished. Some of the foliage also plays a part uh, if you have plants with darker foliage or seed pods that are developing on the Baptisia. Those seed pods I'd like to ripen because I'd like to save some of the seeds to start plants for next year. Again, watering is necessary. This is the little pot of annuals we put in last time, and uh, I need to keep that one watered. And I'll add some uh, plant fertilizer to the water when I water that one to keep these things blooming. Any of the annuals, you can, uh, fertilize and it will help increase the blooms. But this one needs to be watered pretty much daily when the temperatures are like today, which is in the upper 80s. We're expecting some rain tomorrow, but uh, it hasn't occurred yet. There are several others down here that also will take a little water. I have These foxgloves, which are going to seed, and again, a foxglove tends to be a biennial, meaning it will uh, grow one year, flower the next year, and then die. So this one's on the way out, and uh, it's making seeds. So in order to have foxgloves each year, I will let these seeds develop and fall on the ground in this area, or I can just pick off the stalk and take it where I'd like foxgloves to grow another year. Again, they will grow, and uh, throughout this bed, I have plants that are growing. The foxgloves are growing, but they did not bloom this year, and hopefully they will bloom next year. Poppies, again, have finished. I'm leaving these uh, seedscapes. The, uh, these will not spread seed, this oriental poppy. Some poppies do spread seed, and we have some pink poppies in the garden, probably a little further back and uh, down at the other end, that do form seed and we'll save the seeds on those, again, for other crops or to share with others. These, however, do make nice additions to fall arrangements, so I will let them go to seed and, uh, or not let them go to seed, but let them brown and then uh, take them into my shed for further drying. Again, not much to do but water and weed in this garden, and not too much weeding. It's pretty full of flowers. This is one of the bulbs we planted earlier this year. 
uh, the pineapple lily, and it is going to probably send up some uh, bloom stalks soon. Uh, this is a salvia, and again, clipping off this bloom stalk at this point, you can see that two other little buds are forming on this stalk, so it should produce more. This is one called purple rain. So, again, I will uh, keep the spent blooms cut off of that one, come back later and pick them up with my bucket and put them in the compost. Lavender is now in bloom and you can pick that. I have some in the herb garden, but I also have it scattered throughout the rest of the garden. This is one of the knockout roses. You don't have to deadhead this one, otherwise meaning cut off the spent blooms, but I'll do it anyway just to make it look a little neater. And new blooms are forming. Again, once the roses have put on one flush of blooms, which is about now, uh, I've added fertilizer around the base of the rose to encourage it to bloom. I can do that one more time, but as you get into August and later, you don't want to fertilize your perennials any longer because you want them to start going into the fall period and getting ready for winter. And to put on a lot of new growth, that growth will be killed by the colder weather. The hybrid lilies are uh, just winding down. And again, I'll snip off the spent blooms and let the uh, energy go to the bulbs that are underneath for bloom next year. Uh, this one's just about finished. Oriental lilies will be starting shortly. We have some of those scattered through the garden that are in bud. This is another day lily, a white one. Uh, I have several of those in, in the garden. Uh, they had a nice block of white. This one was very slow to get started. Uh, the species is Gentle Shepherd, and it's a very pretty one, but it grows very slowly. And I'm just now getting more than a few bloomscapes on it. And again, I like to take the, the blooms off of this one because it's so pretty and white. Veronicas are blooming now, as are some of the aliums. We had aliums uh, earlier in the season, spring in spring. Uh, you can get aliums that'll bloom almost every season. It's an onion relative, and that means it's not very attractive to various pests. It also likes uh, warm weather pretty well, dry weather, it likes to be dry, and uh, it blooms with various colors, pinks, purples, reds, and they're nice to add to the garden. They are perennial. It's a bulb you can plant in the fall, and then it will come up throughout the next seasons. This one's a Veronica, and it too can be deadheaded, and it will form more new blooms. Some of the perennials bloom just once, and then don't form any further blooms. This one will continue to bloom if you take off the primary one. And you can often see where these new shoots are coming if you look carefully at the plant as you cut off the old blooms. You can tell where the new, new blooms will be coming from. So this one will keep blooming for probably another month, sporadically. The first flush of blooms is always the best. Phlox is another plant that's in bloom right now. It too comes in many colors. Some of the phlox, older phlox, was very prone to mildew, not very attractive. Uh, I have a white one that does have some mildew on it, and I have been spraying it with uh, the surround, or, or the serenade, which uh, helps with mildew. And so this too, I will deadhead, and it will keep blooming for a while. Right now, these are buds on the flower, so it doesn't need it, but once one of these groupings of flowers, this one is unique in that it kind of changes color with the light. It appears blue at some points in some lights and pinker in others as the day goes on. It depends how the sun hits it. It's kind of an interesting plant. It's called Blue Paradise Phlox. And again, I'm gonna deadhead a few of these as I go by. This is Coreopsis, uh, supposedly early sunrise, but I think early sunrise is a little lighter in color. 
Uh, this was one that was a pass along plant from someone else. And so I'm not really sure what it is. Again, this can be cut off. I will probably, instead of cutting these individually, which is a real pain in the neck, it will uh, do further blooms. But instead of cutting them one by one, I will just use the scissors and shear it off once these blooms have finished. This is a, a stachys, and uh, it comes in purple. I have a purple one and several of the white ones. It stays kind of perky even in spite of the heat, so it makes a nice plant in this garden. Uh, the larkspur is still growing strong. It's starting to put up seeds, and I will let this one go to seed. Larkspur is an annual in this climate, and so I want it to go to seed so that we'll have larkspur next year. It's been an a fine plant in here. It's bloomed pretty much all season. I've had some hummingbirds coming to the flocks and the larkspur, so I think it will be worth it to let it go to seed. Maybe I'll save a few of the seeds to share with some other people, uh, and then they can enjoy these beautiful colors of purple and blue as it uh, continues to come up. The other plant that I have here is Stokesia, and uh, we had one last iris that bloomed in blue, which looked pretty with this pale yellow Stokesia. And this was another one that once it, its blooms go, I'll just cut them back. Makes the plant look neater. You don't have to do it. The plant won't die if you don't, but it looks a lot nicer if you do, and you will get more blooms that way. This started out as a tiny plant and now is a, a nice complement, the, the yellow, to the yellow center of this uh, red daylily. This is a, a red Stella and it should be one that blooms repeatedly. Uh, we'll see. It's, uh, this is about its second year, so I'm not sure if it will bloom repeatedly or not. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden and see what's growing there. The vegetable garden has really grown in the past three weeks. We're thinking about uh, harvesting beans probably before the end of next week, at least, maybe sooner, depending on the weather. Uh, the strawberries have completed. They've already uh, finished, and I removed the nets. And what I want to do now is uh, feed the runners. So I'll just scatter a little organic fertilizer throughout the bed. And then hopefully tomorrow we'll get a little rain to soak that in. And I'll continue down through the rest of the bed until we've uh, added a little extra nutrition to that area. I've removed the older kale in this area and also uh, the lettuce that was in this uh, other spot, so I can replant these areas. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to plant some more lettuce and some more arugula. We happen to like arugula in our salads. And for a fall planting, I want to plant a little bit deeper than I did in the spring. And this is a, a lettuce mix, which I'm going to just sprinkle in here. A lot of our lettuce is ready to go to seed, and uh, will be pulled up, and we'll just keep planting new crops for another month or so. And that should take us all the way through fall. Radishes uh, have been harvested as well. They're an early crop, but we can plant more all summer, and then you can uh, keep getting radishes. Radishes come up very quickly and are so that they're available. And then this other little spot, I'll put in a little more arugula. Again, the lettuce is uh, still quite usable, 
but uh, it's not going to be for long if these temperatures continue. As it starts to send up tall shoots, it means it's ready to go to seed and it can be pulled and added to the compost. One important thing about planting fall crops is that they need to be kept watered until those seeds sprout and beyond. But the, this is the uh, critical period until they start to come up. So I'll come out with my watering can once, maybe twice a day, and just give a little water to these new seedlings. I have a cauliflower forming here. Uh, we had a little insect damage on it, but uh, we're still going to cover this with the leaves. And I'll bring some string into the garden and tie this so that the cauliflower will be white. If I don't cover the cauliflower that's starting in here and fold the leaves over it, sometimes the leaves will actually stay folded over it, but uh, you want it to blanch and stay white as it forms. Otherwise it will turn a kind of ugly green and white cauliflower is a lot nicer to look at. Picking things, we have dill that's uh, going to seed. It's going to be ready for the pickles and the cucumbers are starting to form. They aren't ready to pick yet but they're two or three inches long so with a little rain they will develop. I have zucchini. I'm going to just twist it off. This is a variety called eight ball and uh, it's a round zucchini. We like the flavor of it as well or better than the uh, others and it's nice because you can cut it in half and stuff it or you can just cut it up as you would a regular zucchini and uh, use it in all kinds of recipes including zucchini bread. I also have yellow squash If you have summer squash, check it regularly because uh, it develops very quickly. This is celery and uh, you can start picking a few stalks of that. Homegrown celery is really a different animal than what you get in the stores. It's a lot better if, it, if we have quite a bit of rain or you're able to water it, but it's very tasty. and. Uh, you can start picking the outer stalks of that and it will continue to grow. This is the kale that we planted from seed. The kale that wintered over is what I pulled out. And this kale, I have two plantings here. One is larger and again I can start using that anytime and keep that used. The tomatoes are growing. I have small green tomatoes now which hopefully will be red tomatoes soon. I pulled out a lot of the cilantro that was growing in this area and put down my straw mulch. I did leave the flowers that came up as volunteers uh, from last year. These reseeded themselves. It's uh, calendula, which is an edible flower actually. It's nice and cheerful in the garden too and can be picked for bouquets. I left a little bit of the cilantro to go to seed for next year and also if I wish to save the seeds the seeds of the cilantro, when they have dried, are what is known as the herb coriander or the spice coriander. So if I want coriander, I can just let these go to seed and save the uh, seeds and it will be coriander, which I can also use in cooking. It's raspberry season and my raspberries, the early raspberries, are now ready to pick and I've been picking a few. As you may remember, I renovated that raspberry patch this year, removing part of the plants and encouraging new raspberries to come up. So my harvest of the early berries is a little less this year, but I'm still getting enough. Uh, and when you consider the cost of a half pint of red raspberries in the store, uh, it really does pay to have a few bushes. The later raspberries are doing pretty well and they tend, will tend to have a larger crop a little later in the season. Uh, it's a variety called October Red. 
However, I tend to get them in August or September and not October. By then they're gone. Again, the cucumbers are growing quite well. And I've put them on the teepee, but from time to time I need to help them a little bit because they tend to get tangled up in one another. So to keep them growing up instead of out into the garden, I just put the vines back on the strings on the teepee and eventually they get the idea. I put up my scarecrow this year. Scarecrow is easy to build. Uh, it's basically a couple pieces of wood. I uh, made it so I had some jointed arms just because I thought I could. And uh, it's just a wood frame. I think I used one by ones, I, old garden stakes in fact, old tomato stakes. And then uh, for the head, this is an olive oil bottle, which is wrapped in bubble wrap, which you get with your packages if you get things in the mail. And a piece of an old pillowcase. And then some cast off clothing. And uh, the only thing left to do, I used this one before and I, I renovate it every year, put different clothes on it, change it. And I need to Use the Sharpies. To add a mouth and uh, she has eyes but they've kind of faded so we'll. I don't know how many uh, things it scares away. But I have people, had people stand in the yard and talk to it, thinking it's me. I didn't know how long to make the arms or other, the shoulders or other parts, so I measured myself and I made her to my measurements. So she's a little shorter than I am since the stake goes into the ground. Incidentally, I uh, support her with a fence post. And the fence post is, uh, the stake is wired to the fence post which I've driven into the ground. So she's fairly stable. And uh, again, people have talked to her, thinking it's me out in the garden. I guess they wonder why I don't answer or move. But, but uh, how many things it scares away, I don't know. Maybe a few birds that have come to get raspberries, but we don't have any idea. It's still, it's fun to have, and I can use her again as part of fall decorations. So it's getting things done a little early in the season. Now let's move into the backyard. And, so, and into a little shade, which is very welcome today. One of the things I like to do in the, uh, now is to save some seeds when I can. Some I let go to seed, some I save, and some I don't save. But uh, these are columbines, and they're a very nice blue columbine. And what I want to do is use a plastic bag, and I'm going to cut these bloom stalks off. And they're full of seed. So I'm going to turn them into the bag and shake it well and just leave them in the bag. And I have quite a few of them in here. And I'd like to plant some of these in other parts of the garden. And again, share them with a few friends. So I want to hold them upright as much as possible while I pick them. It's even possible if you just have one bunch to put the bag over the top and then just upend it as you go. I'm going to shake out these seeds into the bag and in the bottom of the bag I will have a little collection of seeds and each of these will make a plant so it, you know if I get a, even a teaspoon of seeds that could be the potential of quite a few plants. So once the seed pod has opened is when you can pick these for saving. I have some astilbe in the garden in several places and I'm going to just let that go to seed because I don't mind if it comes up throughout this uh, shade garden. This part of the shade garden is actually getting a little more sun than it used to due to a tree that came down several years ago. Therefore the this hosta which was nice and blue when it was in full shade tends to burn out a little bit. Not enough that I think I'll uh, move it. 
But on the hostas, once the uh, blooms have faded, I don't particularly like the looks of them, so I'll cut those off. And we'll be adding those to the compost. I'm going to move over to a shadier portion now. Two weeks ago, this goat's beard was beautiful. It uh, had lovely white plumes, and now it's uh, looking pretty raggedy, and it too is starting to go to seed. I used to let it just go to seed, didn't worry about it too much. However, when I started finding it all over in this shade garden, and far afield from the shade garden, I decided that if I wanted to keep it, I would need to make sure I got out here and deadheaded it or cut off all of these old blooms as they start to turn brown. So that's what I've done the last few years and it has helped. I've found fewer seedlings. Again, two weeks ago, it was absolutely beautiful white plumes. The plumes are very much like a stilby and I have some astilbe next to it. In this area, this is the astilbe, which again I'll leave. It's a little more polite in its spreading habits than the goat's beard. But these tall plumes tend to fall all over everything, and it does reseed. So we want to get them off, off the plant. The plant still continues to be effective as a foliage plant. And it will not bloom again, so there's no reason to particularly be careful. Just get the blooming stalks off. I have several of these, thanks to its spreading habit. It started with this one. And I've left a few, so I need to go around and find them and clip off the spent blooms. I'll do this with any plant that might uh, spread a little more. I have some goat neck, uh, gooseneck loose strife that uh, will be in bloom in a couple of weeks, and we'll show that then. It too is a very heavy spreader. It spreads by roots, and it has kind of colonized this area. I try to keep it in, uh, in bounds by digging up a clump and keeping it away from some of the other plants, but it, uh, it too needs to be rained in a little bit or it will take over the world. There are a few plants that way. Uh, you have to decide if it's worth the effort to keep them contained or if you uh, want to spend the time or just get rid of the plant or not buy it in the first place. This is a coral bell. Some of the coral bells or hookeras like shade and this is one of them, the lighter colored one. And again, it had its bloom, and I took off the bloomscapes. It may put up a few more blooms, but it's not generally going to do so. Now I have a little craft project that we're going to do in the garden shed. It's a nice place to do craft projects in the summer. And, uh, if you've ever gone to the beach as a kid or with your kids, they took every shell they could find. And I don't know why I managed to save them all, but it seems I did because I found this box in the attic that was full of shells. And I thought, what am I ever going to do with all of these? And I decided to do a little craft project using, uh, again, this uh, GE Silicone 2 Clear. And this is a product generally used for caulking, weatherproof, sunproof, freeze-proof, flexible, rain-ready. I mean, it, it caulks around your windows to keep the winter air out. But it's also great for craft projects. And what I'm doing is covering a can to make a vase with a shell, <coughs> shell motif. And I basically, I'm going to put on my gloves because it's messy. 
forgot to do that part the other day when I started this and it's very hard to get off your hands so gloves are kind of important. And then I put a nail in the end of it to uh, keep it pliable and then I basically just put some of this stuff on the can and I'll select some shells and fasten them on and you can put them on inside out or uh, flat whichever way you'd like let's see what we have here we have a variety this one's kind of an interesting one and again because a lot of these shells are concave you do need to make sure that you get enough of the uh, compound on them so that they stick It's best to kind of work in uh, sections because they, you need to make sure they're sticking. And we try to vary the colors a little bit as I go and the design. Let's see if I have any the larger ones to put on. I'm not liking this one. Maybe down here. Once it sets up, they're, they're on there forever. So if you can get them set and then, then put, the, uh, put them on, it works out pretty well. And I'll go back over this again and fill up any spots that don't have shells with some of the smaller ones. And let's see what I do have here. Then. There are some, some that are bigger, some that are smaller. Some of the bigger ones are very nice on it. Uh, again, they're a little hard to attach, but once you get them attached, they will stay. And I've added some of those. But it definitely works best with the smaller shells. You don't want to use huge ones because they're, they don't go with the curve of the can. And basically, I just used a can. Now, to put a floral design in this or something, I'll use a glass vase in the middle or a drinking glass that fits right inside the can. And I'll make sure that I've got the edges covered with small shells as I finish this and uh, then we can put a beachy type arrangement in it. I've done another arrangement when we get inside that you'll see and also use shells in a different way. But I thought it was a good use for the shells rather than just leaving them in the attic. I've also found a lot of rocks and broken shell pieces that can be discarded and uh, I'm not sure what I'll do with the rest of them but you never know. I might think of something else. Now let's go inside and do some cooking with some of the things we've been able to harvest from the garden. Before we get to the kitchen, I noticed that uh, my hanging planter is being kind of sad today. It's a hot day and it's also windy and that's uh, something that dries out plants really fast. And checking this one, I find it's really dry. And one of the things, if you have a really dried out planter, you can add water, but a lot of it will just run out. So what I've done is uh, I have a, one of my plastic trugs and I've put water in the bottom of it, probably about three inches. And I'm just gonna set this whole planter right in there. And then I'm gonna go in the house and do my cooking and leave it there probably until this evening. It should, from the bottom, absorb all of the water and I'll come out and find that it's nice and moist and the moisture will be all the way through the plant instead of just on the top and running off. Uh, when it's hot and windy, they dry out within a day. 
and soaking them in this way about once a week will keep your planters going when it's really hot. In fact, I may leave for vacation and leave it in a bucket of water and that way I'll know that it stays moist at least for a while. And uh, if somebody's watching the house, they can refill the water occasionally. But rather than leaving it hanging and definitely drying out and coming home to a dead plant, I'll just leave it in some water. Now let's go inside and work in the kitchen. Today we're going to use some of the seasonal produce and the first thing I'm going to make are some blueberry scones. I went up to Jane and Paul's and picked some blueberries and they're very fresh and they're very delicious. So uh, we're going to make blueberry scones today instead of muffins. A uh, nice change up. And I'm going to start with the food processor. I have two cups of flour in the food processor and I'm going to add a, one tablespoon of baking powder. one third of a cup of sugar and about a half a teaspoon of salt. Call, uh, my original recipe called for a whole teaspoon but I would like to cut down on the salt a bit and I'm going to spin this a little bit and mix it and then add one quarter cup butter and this is uh, firm, hard butter that's just come out of the refrigerator. And I've cut it in tablespoon sized pieces. And I'm going to pulse that until it's uh, mixed in to the flour mixture. cut this in with a fork or a pastry blender, I find the food processor is easier. But if I continued working with it in the food processor and added the blueberries, I would come up with a inky blue mess. And so I'm going to put the dry ingredients, which have the butter cut in, into a bowl. And then I want to add three quarters of a cup of buttermilk. However, I don't have any buttermilk. So I'll use three quarters of a cup of milk and add two teaspoons of vinegar. One tablespoon of vinegar to a cup gives you the equivalent of buttermilk. And if you uh, have the time, you can let it sit and it will actually thicken up like buttermilk does. But you can use it right away too. Then I want to get an egg out of the refrigerator and add that and mix it in. I'll add this, the egg and uh, buttermilk or soured milk to the dry ingredients and we're going to just mix it in until the uh, dry ingredients are mostly dampened. At this point I want to add the blueberries and this is a uh, a whole pint of blueberries, two cups, and I'm putting a little flour on them and I'll mix it around to kind of coat them. They're still a little damp after being washed and then I'll add them. And the idea that I want to do is mix them in without breaking them up into too many pieces. Since they're fresh, they're a lot easier to work with frozen berries are very soft, so this would not work well with frozen berries. And we want to make sure all the flour is dampened and they've completely been mixed in.
Now, many of my scone recipes I would at this point put onto a pastry cloth and cut out with a cookie cutter. But there's a problem with that with these because of the berries. If we start cutting berries, they get very juicy. They will juice a little in the oven, but I really don't want them all over the place. The original recipe said to put them on an ungreased pan. And I had a feeling that would not be too successful, so I used, uh, par I used parchment paper. And I was right, because they do spread some. And I'm going to use a spoon and just drop bundles of the berries. So these are, are what are called drop scones. We want to give them a little room to puff up. You should get about uh, 12 to 14. And I bake them about 12 at a time. So. Have a few more in there. And then I'll put these into a 400 degree oven for 15 to 20 minutes. They'll get uh, a bit brown and yes, some of the blueberries will leak out. So you can throw that parchment paper away and you don't have a baking sheet to clean. The next thing I'm going to make is a noodle salad and I've cooked uh, half a pound of linguine and uh, it's been chilled in the refrigerator. Uh, drained and chilled. And the next thing I want to add is some uh, greens, lettuce, and uh, they call for shredded. So what I did is I picked some from the garden and I'm just going to shred up with a, a knife, just cut it in shreds. And I'm guessing, I, I think the ingredients on something like this, a little more or a little less is probably not going to hurt the salad much at all. So we have approximately four cups there. And I'll add that. And then we just keep adding vegetable ingredients. And the next thing that goes in would be uh, two cups of sliced purple cabbage. And I've got this already sliced up. Half of a red pepper and half of a yellow pepper, bell pepper. This is a very colorful salad. Uh, one carrot that's been sliced into julienne strips. Those are little strips. A quarter of an onion. Uh, red onion's nice. I didn't have any, so I'm using sweet onion. And again, I cut that into small pieces, slices. And half of a cucumber, again, halved and cut into slices. I usually take the seeds out because I don't like the seeds. And three cups of grilled chicken. If you want to make this salad one night, you can grill two pieces of chicken the night before and then have it ready to go into the salad. And we're going to put in a half a cup of peanuts. Honey roasted are good or just plain dry roasted work as well. This is a peanut salad. And I'm going to mix this around a bit because it gets harder to toss when you put the dressing on. And it may be hard to toss right now. I want to get some of it up from the bottom. This is a great uh, dish to take to a potluck. It's a little different than the normal salads that you find. It's also a real nice summer supper. Uh, it's cool because it can be refrigerated before it's served if you don't serve it right now. And really you have your complete meal in the salad. You have some starch and you have some meat and you have some vegetables. Quite a few vegetables. And the next thing we're going to make is a lovely sauce to go over it. 
over the top. And I'm going to do that in the blender. I could also have used the food processor, but we already used it. And I'm going to start with a half a cup of peanut butter. And I'm using natural chunky peanut butter, but you could use smooth and you could use uh, the prepared peanut butter as well. I have to follow my list here so I get everything in. Uh, one lime, which has been zested, so this is lime zest and lime juice. Those are the next things to go in. Uh, two and a half teaspoons of sesame oil. And that adds quite a bit of flavor. This has a lot of ingredients, but if you do like this style of cooking, you'll probably have many of them on hand. Um, a tablespoon of rice vinegar. White vinegar would probably work. You just want something that's mild. Two tablespoons of soy sauce. And three tablespoons of honey. We still have more. Two cloves of roughly cut garlic and a tablespoon of minced fresh ginger. Everything but the kitchen sink in this one. A half a cup of vegetable oil and I used canola oil. I would not use olive oil in this one because uh, if we refrigerate it, olive oil solidifies when refrigerated and the uh, canola oil or other vegetable oil will stay in an oil state and that's a little better. And then we want a little kosher salt. And some sriracha which is, will give us some heat. And I'm going to add two to three teaspoons of that. We'll start with two. This is hot stuff. And some water. And we're going to add that after we've pulsed this a couple times just to see how much it needs. We want to get all that garlic uh, chopped up. And then if we want it a little bit thinner, we can add a couple tablespoons of water. And this is the dressing for the salad. We'll add that. mix it around. It does have some bold flavors and a little heat, which is, I guess, typical of this sort of dish, so. Probably not something unless you have adventuresome children to feed to children, but many adults should like it. And 
That's our Thai noodle salad. Now, before those scones come out of the oven, I want to make a simple glaze for them. And I'm going to use a cup and a half of confectioner's sugar. And I put a tablespoon of butter there. And I put that in a little earlier because it needed to become soft. And this is a degraded peel of one orange. And I'm going to stir in about a third of a cup of orange juice. Orange citrus flavors go really well with blueberries, I've found. And I'll just mix that together and I break up all the pieces of orange zest. And a little more of the orange juice. We'll take about a third of a cup. I want to make a thin glaze so that we can paint it on the scones when they're finished. That's about the right consistency. And I happen to have some that have already cooled right here. Which I'm going to put on a serving plate and add the orange glaze. And I'm going to use a pastry brush to uh, add the glaze. I just want a little bit on them. These will freeze quite well, and uh, they can be reheated in the microwave. They make a really nice breakfast. And I promised that I would show you something else made from shells. So as I move these over to the other side of the kitchen, I have a floral arrangement over here. And I'm going to move them this way today. And uh, the floral arrangement is in a drinking glass. And I wanted to have a beachy type arrangement, so I, I'm using aliums uh, that have gone to seed, I, the pods from those I picked to dry, uh, some of the phlox, some uh, parsley that's gone to seed, and various other things from the flower garden. A little lavender, a few leaves from hosta, and some grasses from some of the other areas in the shade garden. And some fern, uh, quite a bit of fern in here as well. So my thought was to make kind of a loose beachy type arrangement, and uh, it goes with kind of a summer meal. And so there we have our scones with uh, an orange glaze, a Thai chicken and noodle salad, and a flower arrangement with shells around a drinking glass inside another vase. These can be removed, and I can use the vase in other ways in the future. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Liz Davey. You've been watching The Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. <laughs>